I am amused by how people want to identify and name the latest design aesthetics and tell you how you can achieve a particular look. You know what I'm talking about. This is English Cottage or Dark Academia or Grand Millennial and of course Modern Farmhouse. But there is one of these aesthetics I find particularly laughable. The old money design aesthetic. Not that I find the look laughable, I just think it's funny that so many people don't really understand what they're looking at. Now, seriously, someone has a list of 55 ways to create an old money look with ideas like spray painting things gold, getting a faux marble bust or red Victorian chair. She even suggests getting a large red rug. She called it a boho medallion rug. I quote, they always have a red accent rug for some weird reason. I don't know if this is a symbolism of royalty or something like that. If she'd asked me, I could have told her the reason why people with old money often have large, red, hand-knotted oriental rugs. The history is that hardwood floors used to be less expensive than carpeting. The wealthy could afford to purchase hand-knotted oriental rugs generally for their parlor. Most of them were red, and those rugs were then passed down to the next generation because they had not worn out. For those with extreme wealth and large rooms, the rugs were custom made for the room and often stayed with the house when it was passed to the next generation or sold. If you're paying attention, that's one of the first signs of old money decor, passing down items from one generation to the next. In case you're curious, the rugs were generally red because the villagers who made the rugs could easily acquire the insects that were crushed to make the red dye, cochineal beetles. The stories behind items always fascinates me. In this video, I'm going to share with you what's really going on with the old money attitude. I think it's more of an attitude than an aesthetic. And how that attitude impacts the interior design style that's passed down through generations. You might be very surprised and actually recognize some of these behaviors. Now, we need to set the stage a little bit before we go any further. Yes, the King of England is the epitome of old money. You're probably imagining Buckingham Palace, ornate spaces filled with magnificent decor, symmetrically arranged and specifically designed to impress and awe all who see it. It is essentially a stage set. No one in the royal family wants to live here. After Prince Philip died, Queen Elizabeth never lived there again. And King Charles prefers Clarence House when he's in London. If you do a little research, you can find images like this one of the late Queen receiving a guest in an attractive but far less impressive space. Do notice the electric space heater inserted in the fireplace, and a large TV plopped on a desk. And I love this photo of Princess Anne and her husband watching soccer on TV in a cluttered room, piles of papers and books, a dog bed in the corner. This is a room to be lived in, not one designed to impress others. For this photo from The Crown, I know it's fictional, but it's recreating a room at Balmoral Castle, one of the royal family's favorite places. Again, a very lovely room, but livable, comfortable, casual. There's a dog on the sofa. And they still haven't figured out what to do with the TV. The next sign of old money is, surprisingly, a much more relaxed, lived-in look than you were probably expecting. So what about this side of the pond? Well, the largest and arguably the most impressive home in America is Biltmore, constructed by George Vanderbilt in 1895 in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. George was the grandson of 
Commodore Vanderbilt, who acquired vast wealth during the 1800s. Biltmore definitely feels like a palace. It seems like he was trying to emulate the old money aesthetic of European royalty. Interestingly, the Biltmore is still owned by the family, but none of them live there. No one has lived there since 1956. They run it as a tourist attraction. It's just not a home. I should contrast the differences between old money and new money. The statements I'm going to make are general, not hard and fast rules. There are plenty of exceptions. New money might feel the need to let everyone know they have money and be very ostentatious conspicuous consumption. New money examples might include people who became suddenly wealthy through, say, sports or entertainment, but grew up with very little and might feel the need to show off their newfound wealth. Or people who win the lottery and spend all their money in a short period of time. One definition of old money is the culture that develops after a family experiences three consecutive generations of wealth and privilege. Now, let's take one minute to identify the values, priorities, and habits of people from old money. There are six of them. Healthy lifestyle, education, family and marriage, manners and etiquette, privacy, and work ethic. I don't want to spend time on this, but it does influence what shows up in their homes. Not as much in the very public spaces that are meant to impress people like a palace, but definitely in the rooms where they actually live. Old money tends to be very subdued. The Rockefeller family is a good example of old money. But remember those values? One was privacy. So the images of their homes are from houses they have either donated or sold. My personal favorite is this home in Williamsburg, Virginia, owned by John D. Rockefeller Jr. and his wife, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller. And it is open to the public. The house has period furniture from the 1930s and 40s combined with antiques and folk art, a passion of Mrs. Rockefeller. They loved this simple home and spent every spring and fall here. There are many stories about the family, like how they didn't want their children to be spoiled, so they, they made them earn their spending money by doing chores. Also, the rug in this room was handmade by Mrs. Rockefeller. Work ethic is one of the values. Now, this is the home of their son, Nelson Rockefeller, who loved modern art. He inherited the home built by his grandfather and changed very little except to add his modern art collection, a passion he got from his mother. Her modern art collection was the seed for the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and her folk art collection formed the bulk of the Folk Art Museum in Williamsburg, named after her. These are other homes of their children. Country estates were gardening, horseback riding, swimming, and other physical activities were enjoyed, along with reading from extensive libraries. All of their four sons attended Ivy League universities and were lifelong learners. So we see how the healthy lifestyle and the value of education are reflected in their homes. Throughout these houses, we've seen huge oil portraits of family alongside simple photos reflecting the value of family and marriage. Some of the homes that are open to the public will set the dining room table with the family collections of china, crystal, and silver. Children are taught from an early age to be comfortable in more formal settings, like a large meal with important guests. They were also taught to be polite to the people who were serving them and make every guest feel important. Even simple family meals often had what we would consider a more formal feel with a beautifully set table and paid help serving the meal. Two or three generations back, even upper middle class families lived like that. My mother always set the table with salad forks and used cloth napkins. She told the story of coming down for dinner when she was a child and seeing the silver goblets on the table. She asked her mother if they were having company. No, dear. They are just the only ones that all match. I suspect she purchased new glassware the next day.
Plenty of other families have generations of affluence and privilege. I think the best window into the lives of wealthy families comes from some famous designers who work for the old money set and actually come from old money themselves. One of my favorites is Libby Cameron. She was interviewed for an article in Country Living Magazine about the old money aesthetic. I will include a link in the description to the homeworthy tour of her home where she takes us through the house and talks about the individual items and her personal style. I've already mentioned two common design features seen in the homes of people from old money. First, lots of family items. Second, a relaxed style. Almost everything in Libby Cameron's home was inherited from family, a gift from a friend, an antique, most of which is just old stuff, not museum quality, and even curb finds, like this little bench, which she points out needs to be reupholstered, but she doesn't seem too worried about it. That's the next thing, reupholstering old furniture, which is a bit of a rarity today. This little bench, truly found on the curb by Libby, leads into several old money quirks, I guess you might call them. People from old money almost delight in getting something for free, recognizing a treasure that others have overlooked. Abby Aldrich Rockefeller collected folk art long before it was a thing. As a matter of fact, she's the one who made it a thing. Other people just saw unrefined, childish creations. But people from old money trust their own judgment and are confident about selecting things that others don't see the value in. They don't feel the need to impress people with how much money they have spent to furnish their homes. As a matter of fact, it's frequently the opposite. Finding an unrecognized, undervalued treasure is the whole point. Another quirk I frequently see is the casual relationship with clutter and tidiness. In my experience, it comes from a number of different places. First, growing up, there was usually a full-time maid whose job was just to run around picking up after them. Secondly, there were often animals, multiple animals, who were precious members of the family. Fur and paw prints were just expected. Today, a housekeeping service might come once or twice a week, and the house might quickly fall apart without Annie or Lily or Juanita. Another quirk is the high-low mix of objects. This picture shows a lamp made from an old sales container for tiger chewing tobacco placed on a table. Libby loves animals, so anything with an animal gets her attention. On the floor next to it is an original sculpture from a recognized artist. Libby wants to have a stand made for the art, but you get the impression she's thought about doing it for years, but just never got around to it. Now, there's another one. People from old money don't feel anxious for everything to be done immediately. Their homes slowly evolve over time as the homeowner stumbles upon the perfect item, eventually finishes an incomplete project, or moves a piece from one room to the next. Nothing is ever completely finished or set in stone. One of my th favorite things I often see in old money homes like Libby's is toys, whether it's the stuffed giraffe in the library from her children's bedroom, or the carriage and accoutrements from Queen Elizabeth's coronation that Libby played with when she was a little girl, or the basket of toys in the living room ready for when grandchildren arrive. Not only is the home relaxed, it looks lived in, with scratches and dings, worn and faded fabrics, often referred to as tattered chic. Many people would be embarrassed to have items like this in their home, dinged up, missing a pull, in need of reupholstering. But people from old money are unconcerned. Libby proudly tells the story of her curb find. Bunny Williams, another old money designer, loves to shop at what she calls junk shops. 
If people are too snooty to go into junk shops, she's happy to tell them that antique dealers find their inventory at junk shops. Aside from surprising junk shop finds, there will be some expected things, like this fabulous oil painting of Libby's grandmother with her two sisters. And these paintings of her fourth great-grandfather's thoroughbred horses, including the horse that won the first Kentucky Derby. Those practically scream old money, but they're upstairs on the landing, not flaunted in more public spaces. Another thing that says money, both old and new, is items from famous people. Her bed and a sculpture in the living room were from Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. No one else in the family wanted those pieces. Many items in her home were gifts from Albert Hadley and Sister Parrish, the two biggest names in old money interior decorating. Invariably, old money is adjacent to other money, fame, and power. I mentioned Abby Aldrich Rockefeller making a needlepoint rug. That is classic old money. People with wealth had the time to do needlepoint, travel extensively, learn to paint, master a musical instrument, take up all sorts of hobbies and passions for learning and collecting. The items accumulated by family become precious heirlooms with stories passed down for generations. So old money gives their children furnishings when they move out on their own, shops secondhand, lives a relaxed, healthy lifestyle, fills their home with family and sentimental items, embraces things that are not in perfect condition, might not even have value to anyone else, accepts that homes evolve slowly over time, is minimally influenced by trends, lets pets on the furniture, expects their children to work, have books all over the house. You might have noticed I refer to old money as an attitude, not a design aesthetic. So here's my question. How many of us were raised with an old money attitude? Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without? If you spend less than you make, you're rich. If you spend all your money, you won't have any. The only things you should borrow money for are a house and an education. You're good enough just like you are. You don't need to prove anything to anybody. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. No amount of money can buy style. I think we need to have a community discussion about this. I suspect a large percentage of people, especially my viewers, has the same habits and values identified as old money, healthy lifestyle, education. I'm really looking forward to your comments and family stories and encourage you to take the time to read each other's comments. There's lots of collective wisdom out there. Thanks for watching and commenting. See you next time.